Excellent. Hi, guys. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is Susan Hackner. I'm the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Operating Officer of Cornell University Veterinary Specialists. Um, I know we have a lot of people registered tonight, so as of last count, 733, which is very different than the 50 or so that we usually have in our auditorium. So while I'm really sorry we're not seeing you in person and meeting you in person and we usually provide alcohol, uh, it is nice to know that we have uh, such a great crowd of people. Uh, no doubt many of you are from areas beyond uh, ours, so um, I'd like to spend just a few minutes before I introduce our speaker uh, just telling you a little bit about, um, about us and about emergency critical care a little bit as well. Um, so we are Cornell University veterinary specialists. We are indeed a subsidiary of Cornell University's College of Veterinary Medicine, but we're located in Stamford, Connecticut, which is almost a suburb of New York, um, pretty much. Uh, we are a specialty and emergency hospital only. We do not do any general practice, only specialty and emergency, and a lot of emergency. Um, just to give you, whoops, for some reason, my there you go. Um, so we have a number of specialties, uh, emergency critical care, internal medicine, surgery, oncology, ophthalmology, dermatology, uh, radiology, cardiology, and we also do advanced uh, interventional radiology and endoscopy. So we're a, a robust specialty hospital, but by far our largest department is emergency critical care and, uh, and one that we're, we're very, very proud of. Um, for those of you, um, most of you probably know emergency critical care is, um, there are a lot of centers out there. We're inordinately proud of our emergency critical care center. We have a state-of-the-art emergency room as well as an intensive care unit that is open 365 days uh, a year, 24-7. Uh, uh, we have an extraordinarily group, group of people, about 13 or 14 doctors, depending uh, on the day, but that includes four board-certified emergency critical care specialists, uh, which is a lot and more than many vet schools, uh, six or seven experienced internship-trained emergency doctors who are very much the core of things, and we're also training the next generation of critical care specialists through a residency program. And perhaps even more importantly, an outstanding group of licensed veterinary technicians who, uh, who really keep things humming. We are a level one uh, VEX, what is known as a VEX level one trauma and emergency center. So sort of similar to human medicine, the Veterinary Emergency and Critical Care Society provides um, uh, levels uh, of trauma and emergency centers so that one can ascertain the degree of expertise of those centers. Level one is the highest, and, uh, and it goes down from there. So, um, boy, there's a growing number of, of level one facilities in the country. I used to say 20, but there's definitely more than that now. Uh, and I would be lying if I said I knew how many there were. But one thing of note, for many of you who are not around us and are certainly not close enough to come to us if you have an emergency, it's good to find out where the emergency practices are in your area and where the good emergency practices are. So look for VEX certification. Look for facilities that have internship-trained emergency doctors and critical care specialists, and so you know you're taking your pets to... Um, to this type of facility. So it's very hard for me not to run my mouth about the fantastic specialist and facility that we have here. So I will, I will stop myself now um, and, and turn you over and introduce you to our fantastic speaker today. Um, so Dr. Rebecca DeSillis is one of our extraordinary emergency critical emergency doctors. Uh, Rebecca is a graduate of Cornell University's College of Veterinary Medicine. I'm always proud to say that because, strangely enough, not that many of our doctors are, myself included. Uh, but Rebecca indeed is. And after doing a rotating internship, uh, she joined CUBS in 2012. So she has been with us for a good long time. She is an extraordinarily talented and well-rounded emergency doctor. 
uh, as evidenced by the fact that she has seen my animals, and I don't allow many people to touch them. Um, but Rebecca has given this type of presentation to a lot of pet owners uh, before, and is always a popular speaker because uh, she's she's been in the trenches and she's talking to you about stuff that she knows and uh, errors or oversights that she has seen that could be avoided, and she mixes this real life expertise with a lot of authentic compassion. So I know you'll enjoy hearing from her. Um, I do want to tell you before um, I hand over the reins to Rebecca, if you have any questions, we will be sharing notes. Uh, you will get emails with notes uh, from us in the next week or so. If you have any questions about those notes or anything else, please feel free to email us at rsvpeducation at cuvs.org. Um, so I, without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and stop sharing my picture uh, and hand you over to Rebecca. Thanks, guys. Always great to have so many pet lovers together. Thanks, Rebecca. Okay. All right. So we are going to move on. Welcome, everybody. Um, so we're going to sort of jump right into everything. And, um, you know, as has been said, if you guys have any questions along the way, definitely be sure to send those in. Um, and we will get to everything we can and everything that um, we may not be able to, I'm sure we can, um, you know, answer in one way or another. Uh, so I'm actually going to go ahead and stop the video. That way I can just completely bring up my screen. And jump right into the presentation. So uh, normally I try to get an idea of who's in the audience as far as who are our dog owners, our cat owners, both um, who are here, um, you know, that, that we've seen before, who's, who's here in the area, where everybody's located. So unfortunately we're not able to get too much uh, of that. So I'll try to give a good mix of dog and cat um, information tonight. Um, so getting started. What are we going to cover tonight? We're going to cover what things are important surrounding an emergency situation. So the first one by far is how do we recognize that emergency situation? Um, you know, what is an emergency that, that is a problem that needs to be addressed as soon as possible? And what's something that can, you know, maybe wait until you can see your primary care vet or there's something you can do at home that, you know, may not require going out to the emergency room. Definitely, you know, in this crazy time right now, we're home with our pets more, we're noticing more, there are more opportunities for animals to get injured because we're doing more with them. Um, so all of that definitely means, you know, a lot more opportunities for emergencies to happen and, um, and possibly bringing up the, the need to bring your pet to an emergency hospital. Um, when you do think you may have to go to an emergency hospital, what information do you need to know, do you need to bring, do you need to have um, with you, and, and what do you need to have at home so that you can provide that first aid care. As far as what you need to have at home, uh, we're going to go over that specifically in what's called the pet first aid kit. Um, so we'll certainly touch on everything that should go along in that kit. Um, and then finally, your true kind of first aid, what we would think of with um, taking care of your pet at home, you know, what can you do? Keeping in mind that for the most part, it is truly first aid, just like with a person. These are things you do at home before you head out to the veterinarian and um, not necessarily in place of going, although there are some things that may not require you to make that trip once you've done them. So according to our American Veterinary Medical Association, these are the top 10 pet emergencies uh, that we see in our emergency rooms across the country. Um, so we will be going through all of them individually. Uh, and this does include kind of a combination of dogs and cats that, um, that fall into all of these categories. So first up, um, severe bleeding or bruising 
or bleeding that doesn't stop within just a few minutes. Um, so usually, you know, we're talking about inappropriate bleeding, um, you know, not uh, a mild trauma, your dog got hit in the face with a ball, maybe there's a couple drops of blood from the nose, something like that. But bleeding that really comes on out of nowhere or is very severe and just isn't stopping. And that can be drops of blood from the nose, just like you or I would have a nosebleed. That can be bleeding from the mouth, usually kind of along the gums. Um, they can be coughing up blood. They can pass blood in their vomit or stool or urine. Uh, when there is blood in the vomit or stool, it's important to remember that, you know, normally we see that bright red stuff, and that is obviously some fresh blood, but dark um, previously lost blood will also come out in the vomit or the stool. So if your, your pet stool looks very black, almost like tar, uh, that's actually an indicator of, of bleeding into the stomach and intestinal tract. And similarly, if they're vomiting up things that almost look like coffee grinds, that's gonna be you know, of some concern too. Then when we move on to sort of that second of our top 10 emergencies, we can see animals who are choking having difficulty breathing, or very frequent or nonstop coughing, gagging, retching, you know, things that look like they're trying to catch their breath. Uh, what's important to keep in mind is that a lot of times, you know, we see animals who are panting and, and that's kind of hard to determine, you know, are they, are they actually in distress or is that just them panting? When is that a concern? Typically, when we see our pets who are resting, meaning they're just kind of calm on the couch, they haven't just been playing or running, their respiratory rate, which is the breaths that they take per minute, should be less than 40. And usually it's actually quite low, more around 12 to 20 if they're sleeping and comfortable. So if you wanna take your pet's respiratory rate at home, you can count the breaths over 60 minutes, or you can count them over, I'm sorry, 60 seconds, or you can count them over 30 seconds and um, just multiply by two. One little tidbit is that a purring cat will sometimes appear to have a, a high respiratory rate. So you might wanna feel under the chin, make sure a cat's not purring if you're you know, looking to interpret that. Also the effort that they have going along with it. You know, a happy dog that's panting usually has a pretty easy effort to their breathing. If you have an animal who's got a lot of effort or making a lot of noise when they suck in air or breathe in and inspire and or, you know, kind of a big huffing uh, push when they're breathing out, that's definitely an indicator that they're working hard to breathe. And then finally, if we do question if our dog or cat is having any respiratory distress, their gum color can be a good indication of that. So we see this dog and this cat here who have a nice pink gum color. Um, this dog, you notice, has these little black spots that's called pigmentation. And it's always a good idea sort of to know what your pet's um, baseline gums look like. Some dogs are actually mostly black um, in the mouth or pigmented in the mouth. So it's important to look for those little areas of pink. Um, and that pink color can vary throughout the day or with activity, um, but, but it should always have some degree of pink just like your own gums. On the other hand, um, we can see dogs who and cats who are in respiratory distress develop a pale color uh, or a bluish, grayish, purplish kind of color to their um, gums and tongue. And that's certainly an indicator that they are in some sort of distress. One other word about apparent um, breathing difficulties is a lot of people see what we know as a reverse sneeze. Um, as a breathing uh, issue. It's most common in dogs with allergies and it can look very violent. It, it really looks just like what it sounds like, which is instead of sneezing forcefully out, they suck that air forcefully in. Um, and if you've never seen a dog do it, there's great videos on YouTube. I think there's one particularly of a Corgi who gives a good example. Um, but, it's, but it's nice to know what that looks like and realize that if you are seeing that, it's not necessarily something you have to rush right into the hospital for. Usually it'll pass after a couple minutes or so. If it's not passing, you know, then maybe that's something you do want to take action on. So next up on our list 
is our urinary and defecatory emergencies. Um, so definitely if your dog or cat has an inability to pass urine or stool. And importantly, you know, we try to recognize that as a pet who's trying to go and not able. We definitely get a lot of calls, um, you know, maybe the appetite's been down a little bit, so they're not going as frequently or certainly after a surgical procedure, they may not be trying to defecate. As long as they're not straining to go and nothing's coming out, usually we're not too concerned about that. Um, that being said, if there seems to be obvious pain or distress with these episodes of trying to go, then that certainly can be concerning. Um, so, when we are looking at our pets individually, um, dogs, actually an interesting tidbit about dogs is they actually do pretty rarely actually become constipated. A lot of times that you'll see them straining and nothing's coming out. You do want to check and make sure they're not having actual diarrhea and they've kind of past everything. Um, some people, it can be a little hard to know if your animal's trying to urinate or defecate. With a dog who's trying to defecate, you'll usually see more of this hunched back as opposed to a female dog who kind of squats with a straighter back uh, or a male dog who usually lifts their leg. Cats, of course, are a little bit more tricky. So if you do see your cat in and out of the box or sitting there to go for a long time, you know, definitely once they leave the box, you want to check and make sure what they've left in there. Um, and another word about cats is that when it comes to urinary emergencies, one common thing that we can see is a urinary blockage. And that occurs almost completely, although there are some rare exceptions, but most commonly in male cats. So if you have a male cat who's kind of in and out of the litter box and you know just passing tiny amounts of urine or not passing any urine, that would definitely be a big cause for concern. Um, certainly if it's your female cat and they seem distressed, that's something we can check out as well. Um, but definitely with those male cats, that's something you should know if you own one that you always want to make sure that they're, they're urinating regularly. Number four um, is focusing on our pet's eyes. So eyes are very fragile organs um, and they can also be something that when injured, um, sometimes our, our time frame for being able to address that injury or that disease process and save the eye's vision or even the eye itself can be a little bit more limited than some other things. So things you wanna look for to indicate an emergency with the eyes. If you see anything within the structure of the eye that looks abnormal acutely, particularly if you see red within the chamber of the eye or a white color within the chamber of the eye, that's certainly something that uh, would definitely need to be evaluated by a veterinarian as soon as possible. If you see a cloudiness to the surface of the eye, so you actually can't even see into the eye or it's hard to see into the eye, it's another indication of an emergency. Squinting in dogs and cats is a really good indicator of eye pain. So anytime you see your dog or cat, you know, all of a sudden squinting, whether it's one or both eyes, something you probably want to get checked out pretty soon. And then when those third eyelids go up for them, especially if it's just one eye, that's a pretty good indication of an eye issue. If it's both eyes, it still could be the eyes. It could also be a systemic issue, but also very much not normal. So something that should probably be checked out. Uh, one other comment about eyes is that our squished face animals, so dogs and cats, but that includes your pugs, your bulldogs, your French bulldogs, what we call our brachycephalic animals, um, because their eyes stick so far out into the world, they're actually a little bit more prone to these eye injuries and their eyes can be a little bit more fragile. So especially with those guys, if you see any issues, you definitely want to get it checked out as soon as possible. Looking at number five, which is our heat stress or heat stroke. Dogs particularly can be pretty prone to heat related injury. Um, they cool themselves mostly by panting and evaporation. Dogs actually do not sweat like we do, so they don't have that sort of in their, in their ballpark to be able to cool themselves. When we see heat stress or heat stroke, we're usually looking at body temperatures above 104 degrees. 
Um, we can see them develop excessive panting. Those gums that we looked at before would be dark or bright red, um, as well as the tongue. Their tongue and gums may also seem very dry and sticky. If they are in a pretty severe state, um, they can have a staggering or a wobbliness. They can even present to you know, being less responsive or having seizures. Uh, sometimes one of the organs that will be quickly affected is the, the stomach and the intestinal tract, and you may see pretty quick progression to them having um, vomiting or diarrhea. Sometimes it's even bloody. And you may feel a rapid or pounding heart rate. Again, our brachycephalic friends, our smush-faced dogs, are more prone uh, to heat-related injury because their panting is not as effective because of their anatomy. Um, they do not tend to cool themselves as well. So very important to especially recognize this in those guys and any other animal that has any respiratory compromise. So in some of our older dogs, especially our Labradors, who may have that laryngeal paralysis, that raspy noise to their breathing as they get older, um, or our little dogs, our little Yorkies or Pomeranians that you know cough frequently, maybe have a little bit of the collapsing trachea. These guys are gonna be a little bit more intolerant to heat, so it's something to keep an eye on them. Number six of our top 10 emergencies is seizures or staggering or loss of consciousness. Seizures can be very difficult um, to say for sure if that's what's occurring. Um, definitely what we consider a grand mal seizure where, you know, just like a person, they lose consciousness, they're having full body convulsions. Um, it's definitely pretty easy to recognize, although sometimes we can see what's called a focal seizure. Maybe just one leg is convulsing. Maybe they're just sort of chattering their teeth um, a lot, but the rest of their body is responding normally. Uh, or what's called an absence seizure, where they're actually not uh, falling down and, um, and convulsing, but just all of a sudden not really responding to you. And then finally, um, loss of consciousness or what I would consider essentially syncope, um, which is fainting, is something that we definitely can see and sometimes will be confused as a seizure. So it's kind of important to determine if you think you know your pet fell over and was convulsing or maybe sort of passed out and just was out of it for a brief period of time. That can be pretty important to recognize. Next up would be our lamenesses. So sudden um, inability to use the leg or unwillingness to use a leg. Um, you know, it's always difficult to know, could something be fractured? Sometimes it may be obvious to you guys, um, you know, if, if the legs bent in the wrong direction or something like that. But really, if all of a sudden, you know, your animal is running across the yard and trips and then really won't use their leg at all, you know, or certainly if there's any sort of trauma, like they take a fall down the stairs or, you know, probably get hit by a car, then those are the situations where if they're not using a limb, we would definitely need to see them right away. Similarly, um, inability to use the legs at all, meaning not just that they don't want to put it down, but that they actually cannot, um, cannot move their legs. This can be an indicator of a back injury, especially. Um, and if you do have small breed dogs, especially dachshunds, that's something you wanna keep an eye on. Um, as far as any signs of pain or extreme anxiety that are not normal for your dog you know, or cat, if you don't have a pet that's typically very anxious and all of a sudden they seem very unsettled, or very uncomfortable, then those are things that are probably a good idea to get checked out because you know certainly some of these emergencies that may be the only indicator that they are giving you externally. We hear a lot of people say that their animal is shaking and almost seems like they're cold and actually that trembling is sometimes the only sign of pain you'll get especially from a dog. Um, our dogs and cats tend to not show us their uh, pain like people do. They don't complain like we do. So that's a good subtle indicator that something is distressing them. Same with panting, kind of another indicator, especially if it's not hot, they haven't been active, that they are in pain. And then certainly reluctance to rise or walk, a hunched posture, or if they're crying, whining, you know, and they're not an animal who typically does that, 
then we would certainly think of that as something that, hey, something's going on here and it's not externally apparent, they should probably be checked out. Beyond that, uh, severe vomiting or diarrhea. So certainly, especially, you know, our dogs who are eating things all the time, our cats who maybe bring up a hairball here and there, um, you know, not too worried about that. But when we're seeing multiple episodes of vomiting in the span of a short period of time or throughout the day, that is definitely something of concern. Um, and that could be true vomiting where they're retching, heaving, bringing things up, or that could be what we call regurgitation, meaning sort of like a newborn baby just spits up and stuff comes out. Uh, that's also sort of a form of that that would be concerning if it's happening frequently or, um, or several times in a short period of time. Um, with animals who are, who are vomiting, you know, a lot of times the, their indication, especially a dog, is to drink a ton of water or still eat whatever you put in front of them. And one thing that you can usually do is try taking away that food and water. A lot of times they sort of, you know, vomit, they're feeling nauseous, they eat a bunch of grass, they down that whole bowl of water, and then their stomach is just angry again because it's been filled, and then they just keep vomiting and get themselves into a vicious cycle. Sometimes taking away the food and water for a couple hours or so, maybe like two hours before you try a little bit of water again, can actually make a huge difference and, and take a couple episodes of vomiting that could have turned into a, a vicious cycle of vomiting, you know, back to a less severe problem. On the other hand, diarrhea, um, you know, again, definitely if there's any blood or black color to the diarrhea, that's something you should get checked out right away. Also, if it's severe or profuse liquid diarrhea, that's something that we would recommend, you know, having a veterinarian evaluate seeking emergency care. Your dogs or cats who have more mild diarrhea that's less frequent, less severe, the best thing you can do for those guys is a nice bland diet, you know, some boiled chicken and white rice or hamburger meat and white rice. Um, you actually do not need to withhold food or water as long as they're not nauseous and vomiting. You actually want, want them to have especially that water so they don't dehydrate themselves. Um, one more comment about that is that our puppies and kittens who have vomiting and diarrhea, we're definitely less tolerant. Um, an older animal who has a couple episodes of one or the other, uh, really usually, you know, it's okay to keep an eye on them, try the bland diet, try withholding food and water. Um, but those babies can get dehydrated much quicker and probably should be seen sooner rather than later. And then last but not least, um, especially dogs, cats can be a little smarter, but especially dogs tend to get into things they shouldn't. So if you know or suspect that your pet got into something, that is one of our most common emergencies. The ASPCA Poison Control Center has their top 10 toxins that they published in 2019, um, and these are them in order. Um, so those human prescription medications that we have, those over-the-counter medications, foods, certainly grapes, raisins, garlic, onions are some big ones. Uh, veterinary medications, a lot of time we see those brown chew tablets, they make them taste good, so dogs will want to eat them. But I've certainly seen many, many dogs who thought they were a treat and got into that whole bottle, and, and that can certainly be a problem. Household products, cleaners around the house are another big one. Chocolate um, in varying forms, insecticides and rodenticide, keeping in mind that, again, those things are made to attract um, animals and bugs, so they do have taste to them. A lot of the ant baits are actually baited with peanut butter, um, so it's a big attractant to dogs, obviously, uh, and those can certainly be very dangerous. Plants, there's a wide variety. You know, some plants just cause a little mild upset, but some can be life-threatening. The biggest one I always tell people is if you have cats in your house, it's just never worth it to have a lily um, because that can be deadly to a cat. And I would always recommend staying away from that. And then certainly products outside in the garden, mulches, fertilizers are another big one. So you think you're in an emergency situation. Um, what do you have to know about your pet and about what's available to you? Definitely always wanna have on hand your veterinarian's name, office, phone number. And if they have their own emergency phone number or emergency line, that's good stuff to have either on your fridge or in your pet first aid kit that we'll talk about. 
the phone number and location of the nearest emergency veterinarian. Uh, like Susan said, um, you know, there are a lot of really good 24 hour facilities out there. And we love seeing people from two, three hours away. But if your dog is in respiratory distress or having a seizure, then you really want to know who's closest to you where they can get stabilized. Um, at a place that that maybe your primary care vet recommends or you know you've been to before. Having your pet's medical history and current medications is also pretty vital. So knowing if they are vaccinated, particularly if they're up to date on their rabies vaccine, any medications they're on, and if you don't know that off the top of your head or have a list and you're, you're heading to the ER, just throw those pill bottles um, in a bag and, and bring them with you. Anything that they may have been officially diagnosed with or suspected to have by your primary care vet, if you have you know, records or just the names of those things. If they have had any recent testing, always a good idea to ask your vet for copies of that and keep copies yourself. And then certainly if you have an insurance plan. Um, so veterinary insurance is very different than human insurance. Um, unfortunately, we don't have sort of these universal um, knowledge of what's accepted or what's covered. Lots of plans are different. So knowing if you do have insurance, is it a wellness plan through your primary care veterinarian? Is it a wellness plan through a private organization? Do they have emergency coverage? Does your animal have anything that's excluded for any reason? Um, all good to know when, um, when you know your pet has insurance. Other good information to keep on hand, those are those poison control organizations. The two main ones that um, I would recommend are the ASPCA Poison Control Center and the Pet Poison Helpline. When you call these places, you will speak with an assistant or veterinary nurse who will be able to take all of your animal's information. Again, you're going to want all that information that we talked about as well as what they ate. And the more information you can give them, the better. If it's medication, do you have um, you know, a milligram dosage? If it is a rodenticide, do you have the package with the information on it? Um, they're gonna take all that. They're gonna bring that information to their veterinarians on staff, and they are going to come up with specific recommendations for your pet. Um, these consultations do usually come with a fee, I believe around somewhere in the $60 to $80 range for, for these two, um, but they'll always you know, tell you that up front. One tip is if your animal has a home again microchip, it does have to be the home again uh, company. But if they do, then your ASPCA poison control consultations are covered. Um, I know I've called for my own dog several times. So um, if you do have that, having that microchip number on hand is also helpful. Also something to keep in mind is that if your animal's eaten something, you know, if it's something like grapes or raisins or chocolate that is pretty common, it, they may be able to tell you, you know, what you have to do in that situation, or you may choose to sort of just come straight down to us. Um, similarly, if they're eating, they've eaten something a while ago or something that you worry may be absorbed quickly, like a human medication, certainly just head to a veterinary hospital, but understand that a lot of the time we will call these organizations because they have this in, amazingly robust database of um, compounds in household products, um, ingredients in gum, things like that, that could also be toxic. Um, so they're really a wealth of information for us as well. Um, if you have a pet ambulance in your area, it's a really good thing to know. These ones that are listed here are in the Connecticut, mostly Fairfield County, Connecticut, and um, Westchester, New York area. I believe AmbuVet also does New York City and Long Island. Um, Keep in mind that a lot of them, you know, unfortunately, it's not like you call 911 and they're able to get there in 10, 15 minutes. A lot of times they do need a certain amount of um, notice or they uh, may not be available because they're volunteer basis. Um, but if you have a large dog that you're not able to get up and get somewhere, if you have, you know, a pet that you need to transfer from one hospital to another, these can be some great resources for you. And then lastly, you know, unfortunately, sometimes when we have our pets in these emergency situations, it can be something that the cost of care for these things can be unexpected and sometimes higher than expected. 
so being prepared for that, the most common accepted sort of financial um, program that most hospital ha hospitals have is called care credit. It's something you can apply for at home before you come into the hospital or a lot of times once you know, you've seen sort of a medical plan detailing what you think the financial um, obligations will be for your animal's care. I know at our hospital we have a lot of people who over the phone um, at this point can help you sort of go through that application. It's a good thing to keep in mind and if you you know and if you have time and you are worried that that may be something you need, they're a wonderful organization who can essentially provide you a line of credit to put towards your animal's care. So moving on to the what should I have category, we have our pet first aid kit. I definitely recommend, you know, getting yourself together a little Rubbermaid box or, or suitcase or whatnot where you can keep all of these things and keeping them in a location that's somewhat easy to get to. Uh, things that you want to have in that kit, most of them can be found um, by some combination of a drugstore and a pet store or online. So the first uh, three items on there, we have a rolled gauze or cotton, a non-adherent dressing, and an adherent medical tape, and those are all for bandaging. Um, I definitely don't recommend using an ace bandage or anything like that. Usually the rolled gauze or cotton will look um, sort of like, like this guy over here. Ideally, you want something that's not too stretchy, something more cotton-like. Your adherent dressing pads, you'll, you'll see that it says non-adherent pad on it. And it's nice because if there is an open wound, it won't stick to the wound, but you'll be able to cover it cleanly. Then beyond the bandage material, good to have a sterile lubricant jelly, one for potentially use on large um, wounds to keep that area clean and moist, and two for taking a rectal temperature should you choose to do so. Definitely always a good idea to have that thermometer in your first aid kit. Uh, normal temperature for dogs and cats is generally about 99 to 102.5 degrees. Keeping in mind that, you know, if your dog has just been chasing the ball outside and it's a little bit higher, you know, you can give them some time to cool down, that sort of thing. But certainly if they're at rest or if they seem lethargic and you're concerned they may have a fever, a good idea to take their temperature. We hear a lot of people say, well, they felt warm. Um, and if you think about it, if we're 98 and they're 101, they're going to feel warmer than you. So unfortunately, that's not um, a great indicator and really having that thermometer on hand is a good idea. If you choose to take it rectally, you can do so with a little bit of that sterile lubricant jelly. Um, you do wanna make sure that the thermometer you know, goes in as, as much as reasonable, kind of what you would imagine being in a person's mouth. Um, the other option would be to take it under the armpit or in the groin area. And if you do that, you wanna make sure that probe kind of gets up into the skin. You do not need to use any of the lubricant there. And whatever value you get, you would estimate by adding a degree. So if you take your temperature in your dog's armpit, and it is 100, then it's probably about 101, and that's normal. If you take it under the armpit and it's 102.5, then you're probably at a low-grade fever, probably somewhere around 103.5. Other things to have in that first aid kit are um, a dropper or syringe, no need for a needle, but just a syringe that you can administer things orally. Things for safe transport that we'll talk a little bit more about, uh, muzzle, which is sometimes for the animal safety as well as your own. Definitely having a leash and a cat carrier or a small dog carrier if that's what you have on hand for quick transportation. The styptic powder is um, what we typically use if a toenail is cut too short or an animal tears their toenail off and it's bleeding. In a pinch, you can also use cornstarch or a bar of soap will usually have the same effect. Having a clean towel on hand, sometimes considering, you know, keeping somewhere, maybe in your garage somewhere, something that can be used as a stretcher or a firm board for transport. Having a few pairs of gloves for your hands. A sterile saline eye wash solution. So these are definitely available at most drugstores, um, but you wanna make sure you're not getting a contact lens solution. Uh, so not the thing you soak your contacts in or rinse your contacts with, but what you can actually use to flush out the eye. 
having an e-collar or cone of shame in the house that will fit your pet is definitely a good idea. You know, if there is something there that, you know, may not need to be addressed on emergency that night, you certainly don't want them licking or chewing it. It's just going to make it worse. Um, and then if you do have anything that's, you know, requiring more of an emergency, just not letting them, you know, create more problems in the <laughs> Um, having a set of tweezers or they do sell specific like tick removal devices. You can get those at a lot of pet stores, um, but those tweezers, which you can use if you do have a tick you want to remove, you want to do your best to kind of grasp down by the head of the tick and pull it out. If you do, you know, leave a little bit of the head of the tick in there, it's not the end of the world. It will work itself out. Um, and then there's not too many medications that I typically recommend people have on hand at home, just because a lot of the time um, there may be more required than giving those medications at home, but certainly Benadryl is one that is pretty safe and well tolerated. And if your animal's having any sort of, you know, mild allergic reactions, a good idea to have around. Uh, the dose for Benadryl is a half to one milligram per pound of body weight, and it can be given up to every eight hours or three times a day. They usually come in 25 milligram tablets. Um, so if you have a 30 pound dog, you would give one tablet uh, up to every eight hours. All right, so moving on to our pet first aid. Definitely if you are gonna administer any sort of first aid to your pet or another animal, um, you wanna make sure you're staying safe. You want to make sure they're staying safe for yourself and they're also you know not doing any harm in an effort to try to help uh, so we'll review some basic first aid procedures and treatments and we will also then talk about pet cpr and then ultimately again you know remembering that first aid is most often not going to be an ultimate treatment or the ultimate care but something that you can do to help your animal until you can get to a veterinarian So on the topic of staying safe, we talked about having gloves. Um, gloves are actually pretty important for the animal safety. If there are wounds, you know, you have bacteria on your hands, you don't want to be touching things, getting, um, transferring that bacteria to, you know, the areas of their wounds. And also for yourself, uh, if you have a pet who say gets in a fight with a fox or a raccoon, you don't really want to be touching them until they've been sort of cleaned down. Um, so it's a good, a good example of a time that you would want something to protect yourself. Um, unfortunately, even the nicest dog or cat, um, when stressed, when painful, when in distress, you know, might lash out with a bite or a scratch. So making sure that you're keeping yourself safe in those scenarios. Muzzles are a really good tool and it's actually pretty easy to train a dog to safely and comfortably wear a muzzle. There are some great um, training videos online. There's a website called the Muzzle Up Project. Um, and you can train your dog to wear a muzzle ahead of time. And then when you need it, you know, it's not that difficult um, and, and they'll wear it pretty comfortably. The cloth muzzles look like this. The short part always goes on the top of the nose and the long part sort of down along the bottom of the face and back toward the chin. And then there's a little clip behind the head. The other type of muzzle is what's called a basket muzzle, sort of looks like the little Hannibal Lecter cage. Those are equally good. Um, they can eat and drink through those. So sometimes that is preferred depending on what you're using it for. Um, but any of those are readily available online in pet stores. In a pinch, if you don't have a muzzle, you can use like a man's necktie or a long strip of fabric and do sort of a gentle tie over the mouth and then again um, behind the head. The only time I really would not recommend a muzzle is if your animal's profusely vomiting or also if they're in any sort of respiratory uh, distress. For cats, they do make cat muzzles. Um, they tend to cover sort of the whole face except for a little hole in front of the nose, although I think they're a little bit less tolerated than in dogs. 
Um, one good technique for cats is what we call the kitty burrito. Um, so you can see this guy along the bottom here is getting burritoed. Um, and it's a really good tool for, you know, getting your cat into one place, especially if you're trying to get it into the carrier and they're afraid of the carrier, um, or if you need to get a look at their eyes, if you need to do any eye medication or oral medication, um, it's a good way to protect yourself from any flying claws. So if you lay your towel flat, kind of flip that first edge up over their feet and then wrap one side over the top, kind of plan to tuck that around, wrap your other side over the top, you have a nice little kitty burrito, even though he doesn't look particularly happy about it, it will help keep you safe. As far as transporting your animals, definitely always have a leash on hand and whether your dog wears a collar or a harness, um, always have a carrier available for your cat. You know, when cats are scared and distressed, the last thing we want is them running off and, and getting lost at that point. If you have a large dog who's having trouble getting up, getting around, a sling is always a good thing to have. You can always get one at the pet store to have on hand or a nice um, towel or sheet just rolled up kind of under the back of the abdomen. You can help them stand that way. You can have one hand on a leash and one hand on that sling and walk them where they need to go. If they're having a front end issue, that towel can go sort of across the chest in front of one leg and behind the other. And then like we said, you know, always an option to have a stretcher available. Um, you definitely wanna make sure that you're able to make, sh make sure your pet's not jumping off the stretcher if you choose to use one. Some basic first aid procedures. So one of the big ones is what we call decontamination. Um, and that is because the time that it takes you to get to a veterinarian, if that's what you need to do, um, you know, may, may allow whatever they've been exposed to to cause some injury. And if you can help prevent that, that's always a great thing you guys can do at home. Um, as far as topical stuff, flushing those eyes with that sterile eye wash is a big one. Things that I would think about um, or situations that this might happen if they get a soap in their eyes during a bath, if they are exposed to chemicals that splash in their face, um, dogs who get sprayed by a skunk, that stuff can actually be really caustic um, and irritating to the eyes. So rinsing their eyes out really well with that eye wash um, is, is always going to be beneficial. Um, anytime we have something toxic that contacts their hair coat, uh, a lot of those substances are oily. So the big ones we think of are flea and tick products that maybe um, weren't necessarily meant for that species or that size animal. Um, but other types of oils, and I've seen essential oils or animals who roll around in a spilled um, tub of, dish or of um, laundry detergent, those things can often be best removed by bathing them with a degreasing dish soap and Dawn is sort of the recommended um, most effective brand. So similar to the, the ducks you see in the oil spill, same concept with your dogs and cats. If they've ingested something, whether or not it's a toxin or a foreign object, um, sometimes it's a good idea to bring that back up right away and sometimes it's not. If it is a toxin, again, I do always recommend contacting that poison helpline unless you've, you know, have previous recommendations from your vet about your dog who maybe eats chocolate semi-frequently. Um, because some of those things we may or may not want to bring back up, you know, caustic uh, substances that they drink. A lot of times we actually don't recommend inducing vomiting to bring that up. Um, but then other times it is important to get stuff out via vomiting as soon as possible. Similarly, if they're eating a foreign object, you know, if they eat a sock, then definitely we want to get that out. Um, dog or cat who eats a needle and thread, we're not going to recommend bringing that up via vomiting. We're going to talk about other options. Um, so contact your poison control centers or your local veterinarian if you're not sure. Um, some options that may be recommended other than going straight to the vet. Uh, the first one is hydrogen peroxide. Some people might have noticed that I actually don't have that in my first aid kit. Um, the reason being is I typically do not recommend people give hydrogen peroxide. If 
you absolutely cannot get to a veterinarian and it is your only option to get up something that might be quite toxic or you know cause a, a foreign body obstruction it can be considered um, but we now know i mean we know the hydrogen peroxide works because it, it bubbles it's very irritating to the stomach and that's what causes them to vomit and what we now know is that it actually does cause um, or have the potential to cause some significant irritation to the esophagus and the stomach, even stomach ulcers. Um, so I typically do not recommend it. I mean, even if my own dog eats something, I'm bringing her into the hospital and, and we induce vomiting with an injection uh, that really doesn't have any side effects. So that's typically what I would recommend. Animals who get into something acidic or irritating, sometimes they will recommend giving milk. Um, so that's always something you can kind of you know, keep in mind as well. First aid for animals having seizure or other abnormal neurologic behavior. A lot of times um, the first instinct is, you know, we hear about sort of choking on the tongue. It's not really something we recognize in dogs and cats. So I would actually say best plan is to never put your hands near their mouth. You know, when they are um, not in control of themselves, you definitely have a good chance of getting bitten. If your animal is on top of furniture next to um, something hard or sharp or at the top of the stairs and you can safely do so, the biggest thing you can do is move them away from anything where they could injure themselves. Uh, but you do not need to restrain them. If they're convulsing, you know, they're not going to injure themselves unless they do take a fall off of something or into something. Um, so really, again, for your safety and even theirs, no need to restrain them. And then as crazy as it sounds, when you're you know, seeing this happen to your animal, sometimes the most helpful thing that can be done is to grab your phone and video record it. Uh, especially if it doesn't look like that typical grand mal seizure, sometimes by the time you get to us, it's a little hard to remember you know, how long did it last? What happened immediately during or afterwards? Um, and, and exactly the characteristics around the behavior can help us kind of diagnose what may have happened at home. Again, with those fractures, you can try to transfer your pet on a hard surface. The biggest thing is, you know, you really want them moving it around, walking on it as little as possible if you're concerned that something's broken. And also in those cases, we actually do not want to place a bandage or a splint. If that's done on a fracture or a limb with a fracture, it can sometimes cause a little bit more harm um, depending on the type of fracture or location. Placing a bandage, uh, especially for wounds with external bleeding, is uh, definitely a good idea. Reasons to place a bandage especially if you're not able to get to the vet, you know, right away would be one, to keep that wound clean and two, to help kind of stem the bleeding a little bit. Um, so things we would use from our first aid kit, we have our rolled cotton, our non-adherent pad and our white tape. So you're gonna take that pad, you're gonna lay it over the wound, you're gonna take your rolled cotton and just start sort of encircling the leg. If you do have um, a cotton with a lot of give, you can pull that pretty tightly. If you have something more stretchy, like a rolled gauze, you don't wanna pull too tightly. We don't wanna you know, fully cut off blood flow. Um, we just sort of wanna cover it up and keep things clean. Um, and then you'll just sort of circle the leg uh, as many times as you need to, or even around the body as many times as you need to, to sort of cover that area. Um, usually if you give yourself about a 50% overlap when you're applying this type of bandage, that'll give it the best chance of staying on, not falling down, not sort of gaping or opening up. And then once you reach the end of your bandage, you either tear or cut off um, any extra cotton or gauze. You take a piece of that white tape and you just go around to hold it in place. No need to sort of go around and make a, a tight circle of tape, but just sort of um, not overlap it so you're not, again, sort of putting too much pressure, but you're just using it to keep the bandage in place. Internal bleeding, unfortunately, um, there's not too much that can typically be done at home. You know, if, if your dog does take a ball to the nose or mouth and there's a little bit of bleeding, you can always try an ice pack. Um, but anything like coughing up blood, blood in the vomit or stool, um, if those gums look pale, that can be an indicator of, of internal blood loss. 
if the abdomen looks distended suddenly, if they're weak, collapsing. Um, unfortunately, those are things that, while very important to recognize, I would say just get to a veterinarian as soon as you can. That heat-related illness, if you think your dog or cat has had a heat stroke, usually these are dogs. Um, the biggest thing is prevention. We, I think most of us have seen, you know, the ads where even a, a day like today, a 75, 80 degree day, temperatures in a, in a car can get very high very quickly. So making sure your animals aren't out in that situation. If they are outside, um, having them be supervised, making sure there's water to drink or, you know, a pool or something like that, like a little um, doggy pool for them to cool off in. Uh, again, especially those brachycephalic or smush face dogs who are at pretty high risk. If you think your pet has overheated, a uh, very good idea to take the temperature and know where it is. And then to cool them, we don't recommend ice. Ice can actually make that uh, too hot blood go um, to the important organs internally and cause more damage. So what you wanna use is a lukewarm or room temperature water, um, and you can you know, pour it over them or take some wet towels and just kind of you know, pat them down with those. Usually you wanna do that over the trunk, in the armpits, in the groin, um, not so much on the, on the head or the limbs. You can also get a fan going, uh, especially if they are you know, heavily panting, having any trouble breathing, that will help and then getting them inside where you know, there's air conditioning, out of the sun, that sort of thing. One big thing is if you start to cool them, if you're heading straight down to the veterinarian, that's probably the best, but you do wanna make sure you don't overcool them. So if you're starting at a temperature of you know, 105, once you get down to about 103.5 or so, I would say 103, 103.5, go ahead and you know, dry them off a little bit, take those towels off, make sure you're not dropping them too quickly because that can actually make them um, sick in different ways as well. So last on our, um, on our list of things to talk about tonight is pet CPR. Um, a couple words about pet CPR, and that is that um, dogs and cats typically don't have a heart attack the way we think of in people, uh, which is one of the big things I think we think of before CPR in a person. They typically, when they experience a situation where they have what we call an arrest, where their heart stops beating or they stop breathing, it's actually because they stop breathing first. Um, so again, that brings us back to if there's any sort of distress at, with their breathing or any respiratory issues, something to get them checked out for as soon as possible. The other thing to consider is that unfortunately, even in um, a veterinary hospital with you know, sort of all um, faculties available to us, CPR in dogs and cats unfortunately does not have the same success rate that it does in people, um, but that doesn't mean that there's not certainly some things you can do uh, to give your pet the best chance. And then the other thing to keep in mind is I would not necessarily do these things in lieu of getting to your veterinarian. Um, so, you know, you can do these things while someone's driving you there, um, you know, or, or you're getting, you know, figuring out where you need to go, getting where you need to go, but I would definitely make sure you're getting to a veterinarian as soon as possible. So the first component of pet CPR is the breathing. And the first thing that we're always gonna do is check our animal's airway. So to check their airway, you're gonna open their mouth and gently pull the tongue forward until it's out of the mouth and laying flat against the bottom of the mouth. If you meet any resistance, if they're trying to close their mouth, they're trying to pull their tongue back, whether it seems like they're voluntary or involuntary, you wanna stop you know, and, and give a few seconds and reassess. If there's no resistance, you look all the way in the back of their throat. And if there's anything in there that's blocking their airway, you can sort of scoop it out. That includes a foreign object. That also includes any saliva or if they vomited or anything like that. And then the way we do breathing for an animal, actually the best line into their lungs is through their nose. So you're gonna close their mouth and hold their mouth closed and breathe over the nostrils until you see their chest expand. Obviously, smaller animals are gonna take less. Um, and then it's gonna be one breath every four to five seconds. Chest compressions are the second aspect of CPR. And you always want your pet laying on a firm surface, so not on the couch, um, but you know, move them to the floor and um, on their side. 
The heart in dogs and cats is typically located right behind the elbow. So if you picture with them standing or laying down, um, it's just sort of right behind where that point of the elbow is. In a large dog, you wanna compress over the bigger part of their chest. You would kneel next to them with your arms locked from your shoulders all the way down to your hands and your wrists, which are your fingers intertwined. And you compress sort of from your core making sure that you're using enough force to get good compressions and supporting their back of their body with your knees so that they're not moving while you're doing this. With a cat or a small dog, you can use your hand and compress directly over the heart by just bringing your fingers together and using your other hand to support their back. With um, a large dog, you're looking at about 80 to 120 compressions per minute. Cats and smaller dogs, uh, 100 to 50 compressions per minute. The sort of old um, tip is the Stayin' Alive song. Uh, if you sing that in your head, that will give you roughly your rate of compressions. And then if you have two people, that's best certainly to have one person doing compressions, one person breathing, and then switch back and forth every two minutes or so. Um, if you do only have you know, one person, if someone else is, is getting your pet to the vet for you, with you, um, then you know, two breaths to every 30 compressions and repeating that cycle. Uh, so that's basically what we'll be looking at for you know, pet CPR in dogs and cats. So that is everything that we had planned. Um, so I think now we probably have some questions. Hi. Um, hey, Rebecca, I'm, I'm going to be your, uh, um, I can translate for you. We've had a lot of questions, actually. Thank you, everyone. I think Dr. Mazzaferro and I have been typing sort of nonstop uh, <laughs> since we started. Uh, no doubt she and I have answered some of the same questions as well, so apologies for that. Uh, but there are a few I think we haven't gotten to yet and maybe you can address, or oh, maybe you did address. Uh, one was about peroxide. I know you, you addressed giving, trying to get to an ER rather than just giving peroxide, but if you had to give it, can you recommend a dose? Um, so usually it is a tablespoon per 15 pounds um that is recommended um i do usually say check with that poison control center just so that you make sure you're not giving it to something that you actually don't want to induce vomiting um and sometimes they can even give you an exact you know amount based on your animal size but that's the general rule great poison control is always a great idea mm -hmm because they will tell you whether you should give anything to make them vomit, because some toxins we don't, yeah. and also what else you should be doing, because yeah. usually inducing vomiting isn't the whole story. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a few questions on CBD that, I've, um, that I think we've addressed. Um, Maz, am I missing anything? Oh, there's some more questions popping up now. Uh, for cat or dog uh, CPR, should we lay them on their left or right side or does it not matter which side when doing compression? It does not matter. Either side on their side on a firm surface is fine. Um, someone said we talk about heat stroke, but what about frostbite for dogs in winter environs? It's a good question. Uh, I'll be honest, we don't tend to see a lot of frostbite. Um, I have always practiced in the New Jersey, New York, I'm sorry, um, New York, Connecticut area. Um, and we don't tend to see frostbite even sort of up at Cornell and Ithaca where certainly things are a lot colder. Um, we don't tend to see that. I think if you're somewhere where, you know, you're in a, a major sort of tundra type situation, prevention is probably the best thing to do. You know, if we do a frostbite where there's actual sort of tissue damage and things are unhealthy, um, I think a lot of time that's going to require um, direct care from a veterinarian. So just kind of the principles of bandaging and keeping a site clean until they can be seen. Great. Uh, another question is, how common is CPR in pets compared to humans? Will we always break ribs? Will the dog come back like a human? Cough, vomit, suck, air. Um, 
Yeah, you know, CBD in, in I mean, CPR, I'm saying CBD, CPR in animals is different because they, they have different means of, of arresting. I don't know if you want to address that. Yeah. Um, what, whatever impression we have about CPR in humans, it's very different from what happens in television, I'll tell you that. Um, but I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Rebecca. Yeah, I think, you know, I think, like you said, sometimes um, we even think about CPR where, you know, we're doing CPR and all of a sudden we expect a big gasping breath and, you know, they come around and are and are breathing on their own and looking more normally. And I think even in people, that's um, not really what we would expect. Um, with CPR in animals, when we do have success, um, it is often very subtle in the form of feeling a heartbeat uh, first. And, and sometimes that happens quite a bit before they start breathing on their own. Um, you know, the biggest thing that we talked a little bit about is that when cats or dogs have an arrest, it is a primary respiratory issue. So checking that airway, clearing that airway, giving the breaths are gonna be your biggest thing. Um, and in, in the best case scenario, you know, doing that breathing before the heart even stops. Um, if you are doing compressions, uh, there's a chance you'll break ribs. It's not 100%, you won't always, it won't always happen. Um, that being said, you know, if you're going to have success, then those are all things that can be addressed if we do have something fixable and we can prevent an arrest from happening again. Um, so I don't know if that answers the whole part of that question or if there's another part I missed. No, I think that, uh, that sounds good. Um, another question was, what about Heimlich maneuver for dogs? Spelled correctly, thank you. Um, that's an excellent question. I don't think you had a picture. You said, I'm sorry, what? Heimlich maneuver for dogs. Oh, um, so so really we don't technically see them have, um, have a choking episode where a Heimlich maneuver is as successful. My guess is that's kind of more the anatomy um, and, and the, the way the chest is configured and the pressure. Um, if they are choking, I think if you're able, you know, to reach in and get whatever's in there, I've certainly had people tell me that, you know, their dog grabbed a piece of something that fell, they were choking, and they popped their mouth open and scooped it out. That's usually going to be your best bet. I think once it's past that point and, and they're actually choking, you know, deeper in their airway or their esophagus, Unfortunately, I don't know that the Heimlich maneuver is as successful. I don't know. I'm, maybe you or Dr. Mazzaferro has seen that be successful before, but I think yeah. based so I on can, your... Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, because remember Penelope? So, um, so smaller dogs, especially dogs that um, eat very, very fast, brachycephalics are prone to this. Um, sweeping the mouth, if you can do it safely, is best but I have, similar how you would for a human baby, put the animal's back up against your breastbone so their head is near your head but facing away and doing three quick thumps yeah. and compressions for their sternum, um, stabilizing their back against your sternum can help. If it's a large dog, um, kind of straddling the dog and then pulling up on their sternum, um, and three quick thrusts right over their breastbone. I think you're more likely to have success with a small dog than, or a cat than a large dog. Um, but yeah, my own dog ate a piece of, piece of Munster cheese I, and fainted. Um, I did the Heimlich and she came back before I needed to bring her in. And then the other dogs ate it. So true story. <laughs> true, true story. True story. Oh, of course, you have puns. Um, yeah, I've seen it work too. I think the little ones work better, and they're usually the the animals more likely to really get something to obstruct their trachea. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. <laughs> um, how best to help a puncture wound to the side? I assume it was a stick, and yes, I went to the ER. But what could I have done before heading out to the ER? Did you say a puncture wound to the side? the side to the lateral aspect. I don't know if it's chest or abdomen. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, certainly, I mean, if there's a, a stick in there or something like that, 
Um, if you do have concern that there's a stick that could be penetrating anything, um, I actually would consider, unless it's really long and you know you think it's going to be moving around a lot, you may not want to try to remove it. Um, but if it's you know something small and it's in the leg or something like that, you might be able to do that. Um, but just sort of covering it up so there's not a lot of motion, there's not a lot of contamination, and you could lightly wrap it. Um, as long as you feel like that's not moving the stick around or whatever it is that punctures them. Um, otherwise, just, you know, if it's a wound and you're not able to get right to a veterinarian, just covering it up to keep it clean is usually the biggest thing. Great. Um, should we carry, what should we carry with us in terms of a first aid kit when hiking with our dogs? I think you could just carry Dr. Mazzaferro. She's small. Um, when hiking with your dogs, you know, I would say there's, there's not too much I think you would necessarily need to do, you know, before you're kind of able to get back to where you're going. Um, if you're thinking like sort of more like backpacking trips where we're, you know, versus like a few hours, um, then not something where you know, potentially a pair of tweezers to pull out a tick if you find it, um, potentially that bandage material. Um, those would probably be my two biggest things that I would think of if you're, you know, if you're gone for like a few days, um, you know, out camping, backpacking, that sort of thing. If we're doing sort of just like a day hike, um, I don't know that there's necessarily anything that I would bring. Um, maybe some water would probably be the biggest thing. They have some nice little bowls now that kind of collapse down to a flat disc um, and you can put it uh, like hook it to the to a leash or your pocket like your um, you know belt loop or something like that um, so making sure that they have water out there um, you know would certainly be just for like a day trip but other than that I don't know that there's really much you need to bring yeah someone who can pick up your animal in an emergency yeah that well that's my rule uh, yeah that's my rule for my own pet is if I can't pick them up they're too big for me <laughs> Exactly. Um, I've certainly had some stories of some owners where uh, some very little people have carried some very big dogs back down, uh, back down a mountain. Um, someone said that they live in Florida, which uh, sounds nice in this weather. Uh, do you recommend cooling vests for very hot or humid weather for my Dalmatian? Cooling what? Cooling vests. Oh. Um, I have not seen those. I don't think you necessarily need um, any sort of vest or anything like that. I think for the most part, you know, if they are going to be outside for a long period of time, having the water available, if you have like a little pool available that they can, you know, cool themselves off in. If you feel like they, you know, did run around and get warm and you're bringing them back inside, it never hurts to take a lukewarm towel and just wipe down the you know, the trunk, the armpits, the, um, the groin. I think that's probably gonna be more effective than a cooling vest. I don't know um, the specifics on those products, but I would think you're still covering them up. Um, so I would just stick with those lukewarm water towels. Yeah. Um, I, ooh, things are moving around fast here. Um, Foxtails are migrating to the east. Any precautions we should take? What first aid can be given until getting to the vet? This is really a question for people from California. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think if they're, you know, if they're in, if you see them, certainly brushing them out of, you know, a hair coat or anything like that. Um, I know getting them in ears is a big issue. So if you have had your dog sort of out in the in rolling in the grass or whatnot maybe when you come back in checking the ears checking the lips uh checking between the toes making sure that you're not seeing anything kind of before it migrates too far in um but i think a lot of times unfortunately even the veterinarians we don't know that it's a foxtail until you know we've done some sort of you know cat scan or even surgical you know opening things up to find out what's internal that's causing that problem so the biggest thing is probably prevention and just you know like i said checking them after they've potentially been rolling around in the grass or out in that area um ears feet mouth that sort of thing um a few people asking about bee stings 
Um, uh, how about bee stings and dogs, bee stings, wasp stings? I know that you have treated thousands of bees. Yeah. Um, yeah, so allergic reactions are, are definitely a huge thing. And, and they weren't on the top 10 list. And like I said, that top 10 list was our American Veterinary uh, Medical Association list. Um, we do definitely see a lot of allergic reactions. The biggest thing that we attribute those to are bee stings or bites, spider bites, which gives me a little, um, you know, also similar uh, reactions can happen later in the day after your vet's done a, a routine vaccination. Um, and I think Benadryl is never a bad idea, or I should say very rarely a bad idea. Um, very, very rarely dogs or cats can have a reaction to Benadryl where it makes them hyper, but it's very, very rare. So I think, you know, if you're concerned that your animal has contacted or been stung by a bee, I know my dog likes to chase them. Um, and every once in a while, if I think she snapped one, I just give her some Benadryl. Um, you know, if you start to see that muzzle swelling up in dogs, um, sometimes their eyes will get a little bit of swollen, uh, their skin will flush red, or they'll get hives. Cats are a little bit different in their allergic reaction. Uh, sometimes they get almost like a big swelling under their chin. Sometimes they get just sort of generally itchy and irritated, which, you know, can be a little bit difficult to determine. Um, but I think you can always, almost always try that Benadryl. Um, and again, that is about a half to one milligram per pound of body weight. Usually I say try to hit somewhere in the middle or start with the lower range and then go back up. Um, if you feel like signs are progressing quickly or not, um, you know, improving, then unfortunately sometimes it's a matter where they need some injectable medications and we can do that in the hospital. Um, if you think they've been exposed to, you know, bees, you saw any sort of exposure there, and there's any collapse, vomiting, diarrhea, labored breathing, those could be signs of a more serious reaction. So that's something you would want to get them to a hospital right away. I would not try the Benadryl in that scenario. Great. Uh, one question was preferable either liquid or tablet Benadryl. Um, it doesn't really matter. I think it depends on the size of the animal. Yeah. So Benadryl comes as 25 milligram tablets, mm -hmm. so you can only really safely quarter it. So if your animal's more than five or less than five, six pounds, you're probably going for the liquid, right? Yep, there's, um, that's, and, and I usually do recommend the tablets, um, because like you said, I think, you know, even if you can quarter it, that's 6.25 milligrams. So if, if your animal's not much smaller than six pounds, you should be fine. Uh, but if you do have something tiny, they do make a liquid. Um, my understanding is that there is not a formulation that has xylitol in it of liquid Benadryl, but it's always something I would check. Um, if you are recommended to give your pet anything over the counter, um, any, especially the liquids will sometimes have flavorings in them. And if it says xylitol on there, that is certainly toxic um, to dogs. So I don't think Benadryl, any of those formulations have it, um, but you can find, you know, those in like the children's section. Um, I, so I, I'm not sure if, um, if Maz is answering some of these questions, but my, my list on the question and answers is definitely decreasing. So uh, I'm not sure. answering them or dismissing them if it, we've had a lot of CBD questions and I know you answered it and I answered it. Yeah. Um, so CBD is very popular. There are some studies being currently done both at Cornell and Ithaca as well as um, reputable veterinarians at Colorado State University, but there's no real published data. And the biggest concern is that the quality of the product that you purchase may not, it has a huge variation in the amount of uh, active ingredient. We try our best to recommend things that are based on scientific evidence and at minimum won't do any harm. And so we can't make a comment because we, the scientific data is not out there. Um, it's all anecdotal which eventually we hope to see some good data out there. And so there were a ton of CBD questions and we're sorry to sound dismissive, but um, there just isn't evidence for us to make, take a stand um, and make a recommendation at this time. Yeah, I, you know, I think there's anecdotal stuff out there. And so, um, 
you can certainly add it to something, but I wouldn't give it in lieu of uh, something for which we have scientific evidence. Um, oh, this is a fun one. I've heard that toads eaten or licked can be hallucinogenic for dogs. I know Maz wants to answer this. I didn't even, I didn't miss. Hallucinogenic toads. Oh, toads. Um, um, Marinus. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so they can really be hallucinogenic, but more importantly, they can be extremely um, cardiotoxic. So even in places like Colorado, um, they have bufo toads that can cause abnormal heart rhythms and, and they can die. And so, um, yeah, that episode of The Simpsons when bufo, uh, bufo, Homer licked the toad was comical, but um, they could be pretty dangerous, especially down in Florida and the southern states. But there are some toxic toads I know in Colorado that can cause um, cardiotoxicity. Yeah. So that's bad. And and I don't think we we really have those around here. We definitely do have species around here that, um, if bitten or licked, will cause. Um, a lot of salivation, a lot of vomiting, a lot of nausea. I have seen several of those um, around here. Yeah. That's always interesting in what they choose to eat. <laughs> yeah. well, That's a this, this is a cool um, question about oh, with MDR1 mutations. Yeah. Um, what precautions are necessary? Rebecca, do you want to answer that or? Um, yeah, so so for the most part, first aid wise, I, I don't think of anything off the top of my head. I think the biggest one is our um, flea tick preventative medications and heartworm preventative medications. Um, you know, there are certain uh, drugs um, that we want to avoid. So in general, I actually do not, you know, ever recommend buying stuff over the counter. Um, with flea tick uh, products, most of them are well tolerated by, um, you know, all types or all breeds, um, but the MDR ones can certainly be the ones that aren't. Um, the other thing is a lot of those products, uh, especially cats, um, will not tolerate. So I would just recommend anything that you use for, for that purpose kind of come from your vet or be prescribed by your vet. Um, but first aid wise, as far as, you know, what do we need to, to do? I don't think there's really anything, um, anything different. If your pet has been exposed to something that's toxic, those signs are usually gonna be neurologic in origin. Um, so any, you know, weakness, twitching, changes in um, level of consciousness, uh, seizures, those are gonna be things that um, observing the behavior, knowing that it's um, an emergency and getting them help for it. You actually put into the uh, internet, Dr. Katrina Mealy at West, uh, Washington State University has done most of the research on this mutation. Um, it's called the ACBC1 mutation now. Um, same thing though. Um, and if your dog is a predisposed breed and actually unfortunately gets cancer and they may recommend this test to avoid some chemotherapy drugs. Mm -hmm. But if you put in MDR1 problem drugs or drugs to avoid, it links you to a website from Washington State University that has a really nice list of problem drugs. And the bottom line is, um, I want to give a drug without recommendation by your primary care veterinarian. Yeah. But in an emergency setting, there's not much we're scared of in these guys. No. Um, Matt, did you answer the question about the COVID, COVID animals? I, I did. There's another one. And, um, you know, it, the, the bottom line now is the animals that have tested positive, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of animals that have been tested. And there are very, very few that have tested positive all of them have been in direct contact with a COVID positive human. So if your cat is an indoor outdoor cat or whatever, they're not going to bring COVID back into your home. Um, but the animals have shown respiratory signs that have been mild and they have not died. And so um, while it's possible that an 
the animals can get it if they live with you, they're not going to be a vector to bring it back to you and your family. Yeah, and the, the cats have had respiratory signs. The dogs, there have been two dogs and they've had weird signs that we don't even know are related. Um, yeah, but there's absolutely no evidence that they're transmitting it. Um, can you comment on hot spots for dogs? Went to head to the vet. We have a golden who gets them periodically. Yes, no doubt, a swimming golden. Uh, usually able to catch early and clean with soap and water, then use gold bond, baby powder to keep it dry, and throw a coat on for three to four days. Um, if it's bigger than a dime and or it smells, we head in. We welcome your perspective. Thank you. This is terrific. Um, so yeah, definitely hot spots. You've never seen one, right? Oh, we see tons of hot spots. Um, you know, I think uh, first thing is prevention. Sometimes it's really hard to prevent them. If they're getting them frequently, there's usually an underlying allergy there. Um, so talking to your vet about um, figuring that out, seeing if there's something that can be done. Um, the other big culprit is exposure to water, and especially in those thick haired dogs like the Golden Retriever, once they're exposed to water and that moisture just stays close to the skin, they scratch at it a few times and they start to create that hot spot. Um, what you can do for that, uh, we don't recommend sort of shaving them down um, straight to the skin, but if they have a really long coat, you could sort of buzz off a little bit of that. I don't ever recommend using scissors, but if you have sort of like a set of clippers, you can just kind of take off that sort of top, top layer of hair. Um, keeping them dry is definitely a big one. Normally, um, the only topicals I recommend is um, a spray, like a medicated spray that um, is a prescription. So I tend to steer away from the powders. I think sometimes that actually kind of keeps the moisture in and can make like a little bit of a cakey layer. Honestly, the e-collar is one of the biggest ones. If it's in a site where they can reach to lick or chew, that's what really makes you know a minor skin issue go to a major hot spot is licking, chewing, and scratching. So putting that e-collar on until you can get to your vet. Um, if they're scratching it with their feet, um, one option for larger dogs is getting like little baby socks. You can put those on and kind of protect them from their own toenails a little bit. You just have to make sure you have a dog who's not gonna eat the baby socks. Um, and then just sort of keeping them clean and dry, not letting them traumatize the area, not letting them get wet when they have it. Um, and then unfortunately, a lot of times if it's, if it's becoming a full on hot spot, they do need antibiotics and something to take down the itch like a steroid. Uh, Matt, did you answer about toxins? There was a question about uh, things other than chocolate that dogs should eat. Um, um, I saw that was up there. We actually have a list that we hand out to people and something for people to put on their refrigerator, but Rebecca, I don't know if you want to address um, so, dogs and, yeah. and I would say cats, so we're not being speciesists here. Um, so toxin wise, chocolate is a big one. One thing to keep in mind about chocolate is that um, it's a variable in that it's size dependent and chocolate type dependent. Um, so milk chocolate definitely has less toxins than dark chocolate um, with Baker's chocolate or even like that 80, 100% cacao chocolate being the worst. Um, and that's all relative to your, your dog's size. So if you know, your Labrador eats a Hershey's Kiss, probably not going to require any intervention at all. Um, if your pug eats a, you know, half a bar of 70% cacao Ghirardelli chocolate, that's definitely going to be a concern. Um, other things that we see, grapes and raisins are um, becoming or have become a huge one. Uh, there is a reaction that Dr. Mazzaferro has studied um, and identified uh, that actually we don't know the exact toxic principle of the grapes it, or raisins. It doesn't seem to be affected by color, purple or green. Um, and we don't know why some animals are affected and others aren't. I know some people say, um, I had one, one gentleman tell me he eats cinnamon raisin toast for breakfast every day and his dog gets a piece as well and he never had a problem his whole life. And yet we have um, many reports of as few as a couple or one or two grapes or raisins in a small to medium sized dog causing toxicity. 
um, that toxicity is kidney damage or kidney failure. So unfortunately, it's a situation where um, addressing it as soon as the ingestion happens is usually our best chance of making sure there's not any sort of serious consequences. The ones that I think I've seen have more of a problem are the ones that come in a few days later that are sick and part of their history is, oh, they did maybe get into some grapes or raisins, um, but now we are in kidney failure and that can be a bit harder to address. So I think the biggest thing with those is if you suspect or know that your animal ate them, um, inducing vomiting as soon as possible and, and then seeing what other recommendations might be made. Uh, Onions and garlic, toxic to both dogs and cats. Cats actually do have a lower threshold for those things. Um, the doses are actually relatively high though. Um, so meaning they, they do need to eat a lot of them. If you're chopping an onion and a tiny piece falls on the floor and your dog eats it, it's not really a concern. Um, if a small dog or a cat eats a whole clove of garlic, um, that can be for sure. Um, macadamia nuts are another one that can cause some neurologic signs in dogs. Again, they need to eat quite a bit of them. Um, let's see, and we're talking foods. The question was on foods in particular. Dr. Hacken? Oh, sorry, yes. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm trying to keep up with you. Oh, sorry. I'm reading really um, about pentagon exfoliation. Uh, yes, so it was about uh, toxic foods. So I think that's... Yeah. Yeah, those are the big foods I think of. Not necessarily a food, but the other big one is that xylitol that we talked about. Um, it's yeah. a sugar-free sweetener. Um, and it is, it's xylitol, which is X-Y-L-I-T-O-L. -I um, so if you see sorbitol or malitol, those are similar compounds and might cause some GI upset, but not nearly as concerning as the xylitol. Um, xylitol is usually in certain types of gum or mints. Although sometimes we see it in uh, baking, especially sugar-free baked goods. Um, and the, the percentage of it in different, in different things can vary quite a bit. Um, so that's why you know, it's actually important if you call poison control and say your dog is eating gum with xylitol and they say, you know, they may say what kind and you say, uh, well, Mentos, and they might ask you for the flavor because sometimes even the, that little bit of information can make the difference between a toxic dose and a not toxic dose uh, because those compounds are so variable. Um, but what xylitol does in a dog is that it can actually cause their blood sugar to drop dangerously. Uh, so if they did get into it, usually within the first half hour to couple hours, you would see weakness staggering around potentially seizures, signs of low blood sugar, um, and then in the next day or so, they're actually at risk for liver failure. Um, there is a question about my, let's see, my dog has a cloudy white ball in her right eye. Is that a cataract? If so, should it be removed? Does it affect her vision? So I think, I, oh, go ahead. No, sorry. I, someone asked a question I was going to answer, but it's yours. Oh. Um, the biggest thing for me is, is did that come up very suddenly or was that gradual? It sounds like if it kind of looks like a white ball in the middle of the eye, it sounds like it might be a cataract. Um, if it's something that's been progressive over time, also probably more likely to be a cataract, but certainly you'd have to have your vet look at it. Um, if it ever comes up suddenly, and certainly if it's on the surface of the eye, then I would be a little bit more concerned that that's something else. And, and um, the other thing would be if there's any discomfort associated with it. So cataracts will certainly threaten vision over time, but that shouldn't be something that happens quickly. Um, if they seem uh, suddenly uncomfortable, if they're squinting or pawing at the eye, then I would worry that it's not a cataract or it is um, an acute problem with the cataract. Um, to answer the question about removal, they can be removed. Uh, veterinary ophthalmologists, most of them will do that procedure. We have Dr. Wynn at our hospital who does that surgery. Um, really, you know, the reason to do that is for vision. Um, so I think that's a decision, you know, to talk to your vet about or even then be referred to an ophthalmologist to talk to them about. But as long as it's been 
uh, a chronic change and it's not something that's seeming to cause them any discomfort, um, you know, that's probably the worst it's going to do is decrease their vision. And, and while it can lead to blindness, a lot of times it's quite gradual and, and those dogs are not too, um, their quality of life is not too significantly affected by that. Okay. There's two questions. Um, One is from an uh, Anthony Gonzalez regarding um, that uh, the holiday season's coming up. What about poinsettias? Mm -hmm. And then after that, there's a question that is, what about rattlesnakes? So do you want to address the poinsettias for Mr. Gonzalez? Sure. Um, so poinsettias um, are something that I know a lot of people um, have concern about. Um, they can certainly cause some GI upset, um, but I think the, the severe toxicity is not something that um, we've really seen with poinsettias. Um, in general, I think any plant is something to keep away um, from your animals. But I certainly worry quite a bit more about um, cats around Easter with lilies than I do about dogs and poinsettias. Um, sorry, what was the other, there was another part of that question? The other question was from another attendee that just asked, what about rattlesnakes? Oh, rattlesnakes. Um, so there's different types of snakes, uh, definitely. In this area, we do have some poisonous snakes. Usually the type of um, reaction that we see is more localized, you know, swelling of the limb where they've been bitten, um, local effects uh, to, to the leg itself. I know, you know, where Dr. Mazzaferro used to be out in Colorado, you see things that are a lot more serious. Um, but we don't tend to see that much of them here. And when we do, they don't tend to be um, as catastrophic. Uh, Mans, are you aware of a rattlesnake vaccine? Uh, the rattlesnake vaccine people don't like me. Um, so yes, there is a rattlesnake vaccine that's available. However, the company that, so, we hear a lot about vaccinations right, right now because of COVID, right? And so a vaccine takes the either virus or bacteria or venom, injects it into something that then produces proteins called antibodies. So in order to vaccine to be effective, it has to induce an antibody response without causing harm in the person or animal that's getting the vaccine. Usually, in order to determine if it's effective, the vaccine has to be tested by exposing the person or the animal to whatever the bad thing is. And so there is a vaccine out there that has never had published um, information, scientific information, where they've actually done challenge studies, where they've actually given venom to a dog after it's received a vaccine or tested whether or not the vaccine that they give allows the dog to develop an antibody response to make them protected against the rattlesnake antivenom. Additionally, there are a number of different types of rattlesnakes in the United States. So depending on where you live, Colorado had pretty wimpy prairie rattlesnakes, but if you have the eastern diamondback, the western diamondback, the, the um, timber rattler, those are very, very toxic. The Mojave rattler has a neurotoxin that can cause seizures. Um, some, some of them can cause the red blood cells to burst. And it's not just local tissue inflammation, um, depending on the type of snake and where on the body the animal is, is bitten by the snake. And so the rattlesnake vaccine um, really doesn't work. And the biggest thing is you have to get to your dog to the vet right away. So things like tourniquets around the area or trying to suck out the venom, people have tried. Um, if you have a canker sore or something in your mouth that could be dangerous to you, you can absorb the venom. Tourniquets can be dangerous. Um, putting ice packs on. Basically, we recommend picking up the animal and transporting it by vehicle directly to the local um, veterinary facility could, wherever you're located. 
that was a long answer to, to that. And I don't, and I don't know I'm happy about it. I don't know if that person maybe also was thinking a little bit about anti-venin um, as opposed to just a vaccine. Um, so that's something that unfortunately has a little bit limited availability. I know sometimes we can get it from a human hospital, um, but that's something, you know, after the fact, if they are having signs of toxicity, that can be helpful. My experience with the cases in this area is that we haven't needed to use it because it's more, like I said, that local issue, maybe limb swelling, pain um, that we treat with, you know, lo more local things or antibiotics, anti-inflammatories, um, but that that can be more helpful for some of those more catastrophic um, envenom envenomations. Um, guys, we probably, I'm, I'm just going to uh, read off the questions that are here for us right now because um, I know everyone um, is, um, has probably other places to be, uh, including Rebecca. Um, but uh, following on uh, dumb things that dogs do, uh, this is a dog that likes to chew up but not eat chipmunks. Uh, any risks associated other than to the chipmunk, of course? Yeah. Um, well, as someone whose dog got a squirrel uh, a couple days ago, um, they usually, the, the little guys um, are not rabies vectors. So that's certainly a positive thing. You know, for that, we think foxes, skunks, um, usually if they're small enough um, that they, they don't really carry it. Um, as far as, you know, certainly the possibility for some GI upset, although you know, if we're if we're not um, if we're not eating it, if we're just chewing it, we might not have to worry about that. Um, I'm not aware of necessarily any parasites that are shared with chipmunks, but that might be something to keep um, an eye out for with like regular fecal exams. Although I don't specifically know of any that are shared. Um, you know, one thing that I can think of is I've seen um, situations where we think maybe dogs have eaten rats who've been poisoned by rodenticide, um, and that's kind of the only thing I could I could possibly think of as concern there. Um, you know, and then like I said, if they're eating them or ingesting them, that would certainly cause some stomach upset. I would add to that, depending on where you're located in the country, that prairie dogs and ground squirrels can carry bubonic plague yeah, and dogs. rabbits can also carry tularemia. So mm -hmm. rabbits and ground squirrels and prairie dogs might be a problem out west pr primarily, mm -hmm. but those are extremely rare. Not, not here in New England. Yeah. Um, so a question here from our friend Ashley. Uh, we travel with our dogs in an RV sometimes. What medications would be good for us to carry in case we can't get to a vet easily? Uh, of course, we always carry Benadryl, by the way. I think that's the biggest one. Um, you know, some notes about human medications, generally something um, like a Pepsid antacid, while it is uh, pretty safe, is not something that's going to help too much in an emergency setting. I see some people try to use that medication for vomiting, and it's important to remember that that is an antacid for like a heartburn type of situation but it's not going to stop a dog from vomiting um, that's vomiting. Um, so I, I, there's not too much as far as the GI stuff. And then um, as far as, um, you know, pain control, things like that. Unfortunately, one important thing to keep in mind is that we cannot safely use any over-the-counter pain relievers in dogs and cats. Um, so Tylenol, um, aspirin, um, ibuprofen, any of that stuff. I would not recommend using. Uh, I think the biggest thing for me is if your dogs have anything in particular, you know, um, any history of anything, having, being prepared with that. Um, so if you know your dog has arthritis and sometimes needs, uh, you know, an anti-inflammatory, talking to your vet ahead of traveling to making sure you have a stock of those. If your dog gets car sick, talking to your vet ahead of time to, you know, try to have something on hand for that. Um, you know, certainly if you have a diabetic animal and you're traveling with them, making sure you're taking the precautions with their insulin. Um, but other than the Benadryl, I don't know that there's too much medication wise um, that I think you need to travel with. Uh, the only other thing would be, you know, if there is any need for sedatives for the car ride. Again, that's something that usually it's good to talk to your vet about ahead of time. 
Um, Rebecca, can you um, address signs of bloat in dogs? Sure. Um, so bloat or um, what we call GDV or gastric dilatation volvulus is when the stomach twists on its axis for anybody who's not familiar with that. So basically we have, you know, your stomach in the, in the abdomen and it's attached to your esophagus coming down and it goes out into the small intestines and in dogs that bloat, that stomach actually twists on itself. Um, and then that big distended stomach full of air uh, is very irritating, it's very painful. It causes nausea, but the animals aren't able to vomit anything up because the esophagus is kind of twisted off. Um, and then it can lead to shock and unfortunately even be somewhat rapidly fatal. So signs of that, um, first thing to know is if your dog is predisposed. Um, so those are gonna be your large breed, deep chested dogs, um, Great Danes, German Shepherds, uh, also Golden Retrievers and Labradors, Standard Poodles, any of those um, big ones. Uh, and then things to keep in mind to prevent it, um, it can be stimulated by eating very rapidly, a lot of exercise before or after eating. Um, some people, there is a thought that raising the food can help um, prevent that. Um, but how do you know if it's happening? Um, so the biggest thing is if the dog is retching and acting like they want to vomit and nothing's coming out. Um, and I'm not talking about a dog who's vomited his whole dinner, vomited, you know, vial several times, and now there's nothing left to come out. But a dog who's pacing and retching and really nothing's coming out, even though maybe they recently ate. Um, and, it, and it actually is somewhat of a very characteristic noise that they make. Um, it's a very deep and uncomfortable retch. Um, and then the other big sign is distension of the abdomen. So, you know, normally you kind of have a concept of what your dog looks like, whether how much of sort of a waist or a narrowing they have at that end of their abdomen. And if that seems to be quite distended, if they seem to be uncomfortable, unable to lay down and relax. Um, those are all signs that would concern me for bloat. And, and Rebecca, this came, this came up in, in one of our threads and questions, uh, and I'd reminded people that that's not something to wait on to see if it subsides. Mm -hmm. um, if they do have GDV, it is life-threatening, and a very, very big factor in their survival mm -hmm. is how soon we see them from yeah. the time that they twist. So please don't sit on those. Get them, get them to the nearest emergency ASAP. Yeah. Um, here's a really good question um, and something that uh, I love when people ask is, how can you tell when being off her food is the verge of something more serious? My senior dog was off her food, vomited a couple of times one day, offered her a bland diet she didn't eat, but drank some water, and the next day she had full-blown pancreatitis that we did not see coming. Yeah. Um, I think one thing is it depends on your animal. Um, if you have an animal who's never turned down food a day in their life, then I think it's probably more reasonable to be concerned if they're missing a meal. Um, you know, obviously some animals, that's just not their, um, you know, that's not how they are. And maybe they're a little bit pickier and you might sit on that a little bit. I think looking for some of those other subtle signs, um, the trembling, the excessive panting, the weakness, the also not wanting to get up. Um, you know, if your animal misses one meal, but they're still playing, chasing their toys, um, you know, no vomiting, no diarrhea, no other outward signs, then I probably wouldn't be too concerned about that. Um, but if they're having any of those other problems, then I definitely would. Um, the other thing that I think is very reasonable to do, which can sort of sometimes give you an idea of how severe their inappetence or aversion to food is, is offer something a little bit different. And usually I would say in the form of a bland diet, uh, you know, so if all of a sudden they won't eat their regular food, you can always try, unless you know of an allergy specifically that your pet's been diagnosed with, you can always try some boiled chicken and rice, some hamburger meat and rice, some, you know, low fat cottage cheese, plain scrambled eggs, those types of things and see if, you know, you can tempt them back that way. But if they are having any of those other signs, if they're lethargic, if they seem uncomfortable, painful, can't rest, if they're panting excessively or have any other gastrointestinal signs, 
those are the ones I would get checked out sooner rather than later. Excellent. And, and if I can add something to that, I think one thing to bear in mind is what your threshold is based on the animal. So if you have an elderly animal or specifically an animal with kidney failure, uh, we had a question earlier about chemotherapy, you're not going to sit and wait as readily as you would with a two, three-year-old healthy dog. Uh, and, and that's particularly true if your animal has any kind of kidney compromise. You don't want them going with that water and getting dehydrated. Mm -hmm. So you would you would just have a different threshold and err on the side of being overly cautious if yeah. your animal has other issues mm -hmm. or is elderly because yeah. what they tolerated at five like us they don't tolerate it at fifteen yeah or very young on the flip side either end exactly exactly um, uh, anything we can do once we notice bloats the dog is unresponsive and not breathing but the ER vet is more than twenty minutes away. Did you say, Did you say with, it says with, oh, if an animal is not responsive and not breathing to the ER is more than 20 minutes away? Unfortunately, just get in the car and drive is what I would say. You know, sometimes there are things that um, can look worse than they are and you can get to us in time. Sometimes, unfortunately, there are things that there's just nothing that can be done at home that that is gonna turn it around um, You know if you have someone to drive for you and they're not breathing I you can do the rescue breaths for sure um, that part of CPR that we talked about um, Most animals you can feel a heartbeat over that point of the chest that I showed you uh, so sometimes you know it's it's good for us to know if someone's bringing in an animal who has had this happen at home, you know, when was the last time they were seen to be breathing? When did you feel a heartbeat last? Unfortunately, if you're that far out, um, you know, the, the, there's not too much you're going to be able to do other than to try to start CPR. And I wouldn't delay getting in the car and starting to drive to do CPR. Yeah. Well, I think that's it. I'm just typing a response to someone. Uh, we unbelievably have responded to 96 questions um, during the course of your talk, um, which, which shows how engaged and what we've had some really, really great questions and I really appreciate it. Um, I know someone asked questions about pemphigus foliaceus, which is a dermatologic issue. And um, I know all of us on this call would uh, rather you speak to a dermatologist about that. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, for attending. I really, really appreciate it. Rebecca, thank you so much. That was awesome. And Dr. Mazzaferro for, for your assistance. Um, we're here if you need us. Um, Dawn is um, on top of sending out to everyone who attended. We have your emails. We'll send you some notes. We'll send you some recordings. Uh, we will plan to have more of these sessions, of course. Uh, part of our mission at CUVS is providing education and just um, just trying to help uh, and improve lives for animals everywhere. So uh, I know Dawn has also asked for ideas for other sessions that we can have, and we're happy to do that. Um, thank you for attending. Really appreciate it. And thank you, Dr. DeSillis. That was lovely. Yeah, of course. Now go hug your dogs and cats. <laughs> Bye. Bye now.